Good evening, my friends. This is the Grim Flayer. Hope you're doing very well tonight, and welcome to the first of at least two, possibly more, Modern Horizons 2 speculation videos done well in advance of the first official spoilers. Now, we could speculate in a variety of different ways. One way in which we could speculate is on what currently modern legal cards they are going to possibly reprint. We do know that, for example, enemy fetchlands will be reprinted, and that's a useful form of speculation, not what we're doing in this mini-series. We could also speculate on what new designs they might include in Modern Horizons 2, and another very useful form of speculating, you know, maybe the Swords of X and Y, that cycle could be completed. We could speculate on other currently existing design space or meta needs or what have you that they could fill with direct to modern designs. That is also not what we're doing here. Then what are we doing? Well, we are looking at some of the most likely and interesting, it has to be a combination of the two, cards that could be ported to modern from older sets. So cards that already exist in the Magic the Gathering card pool. Some of them might see play in a format like Legacy or Commander, and whether they could be ported to modern via modern Horizons too. So again, we're looking for a criteria of something that is likely-ish, at least, um, within the realm of possibility, and also interesting. So I am going to analyze many cards here, and a lot of them are coming from suggestions in my Discord, so thank you to everybody who participated in this fun video. I'll shout out those people and their thoughts and their suggestions, and then I'll get right into the analysis for a handful of cards here, and there is going to be more videos like this to come, and I hope you, see, you stay tuned for the rest of those. Without any further ado, thank you for watching. Let's dive right in. First up, my friends, as you knew it would be, is a black interactive card, a Orzov card, technically. Vindicate. One gray, one white, one black, for a sorcery, destroy target permanent. Gerard admonishes you, do not mourn for me, this is my destiny. We love Vindicate, what a cool card. Let's see what the Discord had to say about it. We're going to focus in on Yugernaut, on Gee's right up here. He says, personally, I would love to see Vindicate. In the past, I think Vindicate would have been far too powerful for modern being able to answer literally any permanent your opponent played one for one would have been insane two years ago but look at the main threats in modern right now uro omnath titan field of the dead any sort of my card kills your card answer is not nearly on the same power level it would have been in the past especially at sorcery speed for three mana so while underwhelming i think it would provide another tool for black white strategies that they desperately need plus the card is sweet to play with Basically, I want a set that adds something modern is missing, but without multiple bands and entire format warps over the next year. Very well said, my friend. We also have Dawes Sauce, maybe Lotus's Dan, hyped about Vindicate, and I think LL Coolwoods was the first one to talk about Vindicate when I opened it up to this questionnaire for the video. But Vindicate has popped around um, this Discord and other discussions for quite some time, and um, I myself have mentioned it. I think I was on the Vindicate train for MH1, obviously. We didn't get it then. Maybe we will get it now. You know, Vindicate reminds me a lot of Maelstrom Pulse. They're both three mana, sorcery speed, interactive cards, and they have similar casting costs in terms of the color demands, although Pulse is green, Vindicate is white, and they would see play in similar style of decks. The big difference is Maelstrom Pulse is an X for one, at least potentially. Often you will be using it as an uber flexible one for one, but you can tag two champions of the parish sometimes with the maelstrom pulse you can tag two ether vials with it or you can tag 30 goblin tokens after the storm player in game two goes off with empty the warrens vindicate unable to do any of that it is always a one for one but crucially vindicate can destroy target permanent as opposed to target non-land permanent, thereby enabling dead guy decks or maybe even Abzan decks, maybe Mardu decks, who knows who might reach for this card, to have a little bit of main deck land hate. That is not dead outside of that role. This could supplement Field of Ruin quite nicely in a two-color dead guy ale deck plan or even Ghost Quarter, but of course Ghost Quarter is setting you back on lands and you do need to get to three mana for Vindicate. And realistically speaking, 
thinking, how many times can you spend three mana at sorcery speed in modern to repeatedly one for one your opponent? So would people really be doing this as a four of? I don't know. I think Vindicate in the roles I outlined here is a slam dunk. I think Guy is completely correct. This is the exact type of card we need to be looking for out of this set. I will make one caveat. If we introduce other land destruction cards into the format, we want to make sure that we're not just rolling out the red carpet for a really oppressive land destruction strategy in these colors, especially given Vindicate's aforementioned flexibility. So if the land destruction plan is not exactly live, you can at least kill things with Vindicate, which again, good in the context of a fair mid-range deck, do want to be a little bit wary about a black-white Ponza variant of some kind, but beyond that, Vindicate definitely on my wish list, right near the top for MH2. Another interactive Orzhov Sorcery following close on Vindicate's heels, Gerard's Verdict. You notice the flavor text synergy I got going on, guys? Never let it be said I don't put any thought into these videos. This is a white-black sorcery target player, so it does get stopped by unfortunately, Veil of Summer, Leyline of Sanctity, the usual suspects, but target player discards two cards from his or her hand. You gain three life for each land card discarded this way. So in some ways, this is reminiscent of him to Torok, simply because it is a two-for-one discard effect that is more playable than existing two-for-one discard effects. Him is a totally different kettle of fish. We'll go back to talking about that one in a moment, actually, but to focus first on Gerard's verdict, which which I think is much more easily advocated for in the modern format. We have to give Connor Gamel32 credit for being the first one, one of the first comments in this thread saying, gimme Gerard's verdict. And we also have John Dorian Smith, maybe Lotus's Dan, big fans of verdict as well, but we're going to zero in on Maximaze's case for it. He says one card on my wish list is verdict. It would be nice to see dead guy get a new card for its toolkit. Most lists run some number of Tide Hollow Sculler. But the problem with that card is as soon as it leaves the battlefield, opponent gets their card back. While we miss out on the choice in what cards our opponent bins, trading two cards for one with the potential of a little bit of life gain doesn't seem so bad to me, especially in the burn matchup. It would be a lose-lose for them, and he goes on to explain that other printings, new and old, that see play in Dead Guy like Kaya's Guile, Batter Skull, Kaya Orzov Usurper, a lot of direct, powerful, or at least incidental life gain there. It could really solidify Dead Guy Ill in that strategy, right? So Gerard's verdict, what do we think about this one? I'm honestly a big, big fan. We do on this channel advocate for depletion. I have gone into that in significant detail in the past. I will not do so again. You can look up the video Anatomy of a Planeswalker for a more fleshed out experience with depletion versus resource generation. But in short, I do think that this lends itself to really interesting gameplay, really skill testing, enjoyable gameplay in a way that the fire design is kind of the opposite ethos of in, a, in several important ways anyway. And the upside of life gain is really interesting. You know, these things do matter. It just adds another layer of complexity to the card. I don't see why this would be an issue. Uh, two for ones are everywhere in modern and most of them draw cards and it is more of a guaranteed two for one um, to draw a card. It is also arguably more oppressive than a discard effect, which can as always be a dead top deck. So I think this card is really, really interesting. I don't see any reason why it couldn't be in the set. So let's touch on him to Turok before we move away from this type of effect. It's the same thing as Verdict, except it's black-black instead of black-white. And there is no incidental life gain, but it has a huge upside in that the two cards your opponent discards will be at random. And many people have said that this is too powerful for modern. I am uncertain that that is true. I think recent the recent past has showed us the sheer power of resource generation and again these two for ones that are discard oriented i do acknowledge my bias here i do acknowledge that i might be overreaching if i say that him even might be okay for modern but that's my take right now i think it's something that would not break modern in half and again 
maybe like some of our other printings, such as Vindicate that we're advocating for, we do have to say we're taking this in isolation. This could be broken alongside other new printings, but the randomization is definitely a relic of old magic design, and it is seems to me like it's something that they don't want to bring back. However, you know, in the relatively recent past before the Faithless Looting Ban, we did see randomization, um, a relatively big part of the metagame in the form of Goblin Lore, Burning Inquiry, similar types of cards in the Hollow One archetype. Personally, you know, every now and then it is a bit of a bad feeling to randomly discard your entire playable half of your hand and draw into another unplayable half, especially after mulling, so I do understand that. But at the same time, would I trade the Faithless Looting meta for the current modern meta? Absolutely. I actually really like playing against Hollow One, and I regarded that randomization as kind of the the price you pay for participating in an otherwise really interesting and skill-testing match. There is a world in which him to Torok provide some of the same incentives and some of the same feelings. I know never, not everybody shares that opinion. Let me know in the comments what you think about him to Torok potentially in Modern. Another card I'd like to look at, my friends, is Sulfuric Vortex. It is a 3-mana enchantment for 1 gray, 2 red. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, Sulfuric Vortex deals 2 damage to that player. If a player would gain life, that player gains no life instead. So, over to the Discord for Mr. S. Mirabito. A really good write-up from him. We also have Lame Boy Ashes, both on the Sulfuric Vortex train, but Mirabito makes the case. My second vote is for Sulfuric Vortex. I'm a firm believer that a good format has a powerful burn strategy. Big, big agreement from myself here. Absolutely a big fan of that. The absence of burn in the recent past, although it is making a comeback, in modern has been very disturbing to me. Mirabito goes on to say this is because burn slash red deck win strats police a format and keep other decks honest with a straightforward get him dead MO. I think this card would be a powerful tool in their arsenal, might even help against the life gain draw cards piles that run rampant in the format currently. It being a 3 mon enchantment also rewards the decks that run abrupt decay assassins trophy effects, which would add further elements of interaction to the modern format. I could not say it better myself, my friend. Very well said, as all of the comments we've read so far have been, and this is a really interesting, I think, skill testing card as well, insofar as a damage spell can be, because, you know, it is a little slow. Three mana, historically well above the rate that Burn is willing to pay, doesn't do anything upon resolution, first trigger only dealing two, right? So those are three major strikes against this as a top deck in a close race or in isolation in a vacuum, but obviously it is a hate piece against life gain, and if it goes unchecked, it will bury the opponent pretty hard. Note also, though, in maybe a fourth strike, it is symmetrical too, so it's not free for the burn opponent. A couple people in my Discord as a course of this conversation have mentioned this. I will echo it here. Don't you guys miss symmetrical design? The big glaring exam example of why asymmetrical design can be really feel bad are all the war planeswalkers, war of the spark planeswalkers, who not only have static abilities, but who have one-sided static abilities. When very powerful effects are symmetrical. It just makes the game that much more interesting. And I promise not to use this phrase too much more, skill testing. But back to Mirabito's point, I'm down for the tier one burn. How about you? I do think that burn near the top of the metagame or as something that fluctuates between tier one and tier two based on the metagame is indicative of a healthy format. I see no reason not to aspire to that in modern. Maybe you agree with that take, but you don't think I've gone far enough. Well, maybe Price of Progress is for you. It is an instant for one gray and one red. Price of Progress deals two damage to each player for each non-basic land he or she controls. So a lower floor, admittedly, than Sulfuric Vortex in a couple different ways, but a significantly higher ceiling. I guess, most of the time, although given an infinite timeline, of course, the repeated damage of Sulfuric Vortex will be higher, but you understand the point. I think we can call Price of Progress a more powerful card. Don't get me wrong, the card is obviously insanely powerful. I'm not really afraid of insanely powerful cards. I'm afraid of insanely powerful cards that also cannot fail because they draw a card, and at worst, they can trip. 
and or shut off entire phases of the game. Teferi Time Raveler is an example of something that does both. So while I do want to exercise caution with printing really powerful things into it, Price of Progress is not as much of a red flag as some of the most recent printings, frankly, have been, and I'm not alone in that. We've got, again, several voices in the Discord. Uh, to be fair, not all of them saying that we should have this. Ashes is down for Price of Progress. We have Lame Boy saying that Price of Progress is probably too good, but maybe we could get a slightly nerfed version. LL Coolwoods all the way in for Price of Progress. Um... And it helps turn the corner um, by being higher impact than the typical burn selection and also punishing greedy mana bases at the same time. We also have Bobby saying that Price of Progress, while it might be good, might be okay for modern, he doesn't think it's going to be that likely if you look at Wizards' recent design priorities, and that's definitely something to consider as well. Probably applies to a lot of the interesting cards that we're discussing here. But let's look to maybe Lotus's Dan for the real rundown on Price of Progress. He says it might be what modern needs. Non-basic lands are one of the most abused card types right now and also one of the most difficult to interact with. Legalizing POP would incentivize less greedy mana bases and leaner curves to combat the super high ceiling monster of a burn spell. This could pave the way for a return of two-color mid-range and control decks to competitive viability. Burn is vulnerable to interaction. So true. And when it's a top deck, people have shown a willingness to play life gain in their sideboards, indeed main deck. Other answers to red spells are already played in large numbers. Aether Gust, Brutality, Force of Negation, and so on, often main deck. Wizards have kept on printing super potent life gain from Weather the Storm to Uro. No color is unable to interact meaningfully with Burn, and there is often overlapping benefits to playing these cards against other red decks. I think Modern could survive a stronger burn deck and would be better for it. Uh, these comments, especially this one from Dan, guys, again, I couldn't say it better myself. Now, that doesn't mean that Price of Progress specifically is a guaranteed safe card, good card, all the rest, but it is, I think, pretty indisputable that the overall case Dan is making is true. Do you not feel so good about your deck when you're like, okay, what do I have to do to tech against Burn? Now, obviously, there are a few matchups here and there. Burn is going to be the nightmare matchup for a couple people. But in general, I think people feel a lot like they have a lot more agency when they're like, oh boy, I'm kind of afraid of Burn, than they are, you know, being a mid-range deck against Big Mana in Uro or being maybe a combo deck against, like, the Shadow decks. So I think Burn, again, we want it to be a format policeman. Is Price of Progress too far? You let me know. Before we leave the subject of Burn altogether, let's just briefly mention Chain Lightning. Chain Lightning being a sorcery speed lightning bolt, it can deal three damage to any target. That's what Lightning Bolt does. It's the functional reprint of Lightning Bolt, the closest to it we're probably likely to get. There is also an interesting secondary ability each time Chain Lightning does damage. The target or target's controller may then pay double red to have Chain Lightning do three damage to any target of that player's choice. So in Red Mirrors, Chain Lightning can be an extraordinarily interesting card, I'm sure. We did have a couple Discord denizens, including Matt and Lame Boy, not really make a huge case for Chain Lightning, and as we've seen other people people make cases for other cards, but mention it in their wish list, some of which I say are very ambitious. I'm not covering everything, as you can see here. The responses, there is a dearth of them. There is a plethora of them. I can't cover everything, trying to cover what I think are the most realistic, beneficial, and interesting ones, and also powerful ones. You know, we're not playing it too safe. Anyway, Chain Lightning, uh, much like some of the other caveats we've made, let's make this caveat. Chain Lightning, Price of Progress, and Self Sulfuric Vortex, you should not print two of these, much less all three of them, together into modern. Maybe one at the most. Which one should it be? I don't have a strong opinion, but I think I would like to see Wizards uh, give Burn a boost back up and print one of these or explore other similar interesting design space with new printings. But Chain Lightning, coming from Legends, that cool kind of chain ability, that secondary ability. This is a really interesting card for me. I would definitely not be adverse to it. Again, taken alone.
And next up, my friends, we got a doozy for you dating all the way back to Alpha. This is Sinkhole for the low, low price of BB. It is a sorcery that reads destroys any one land in the archaic verbiage, or in more modern parlance, it would say destroy target land. Now, we've got MomQuest as the resident Discord champion of the Sinkhole, and I myself have mentioned Sinkhole for a while as like, would they really? And if they did... Wow, how could we really seek to leverage this? And uh, MomQuest says, Sinkhole to make the rock great again. We have Daniela MS, Lameboy Lucas, both of whom are on the Sinkhole train as well, or at least saying, wow, wouldn't this be spectacular? MomQuest goes on to elaborate, I want Sinkhole, though it is the top of my M2 MH2 wish list. It is the perfect card to make the rock the best GBX deck again. Fits right in the curve, universal attrition. We super need better LD. In modern, and while all of that may be true, Sinkhole is a very, very scary card. We definitely have a... We have to acknowledge that straight-up land destruction, a stone rain effect at two mana, has got to be something that Wizards is extremely leery of printing. And also, we do know that... Historically, on the other hand, they've violated this rule in the past. I'm thinking of Renan 6. Who would ever have thought they would print such a pushed Planeswalker at CMC 2? So in theory, they could do the same with Sinkhole. In practice, I do think, despite the recent exceptions they've made, this is unlikely. They've said in the past that land destruction is perceived by the community to be an unfun strategy. If we did print Sinkhole, we would have to be very wary of the aforementioned possibility of printing printing Vindicate alongside other existing play patterns that could be full-on Black Ponza with Reign of Tears and or Fulminator Mage. We'd have to watch out for Smallpox, and the list goes on. So Sinkhole, I mean, I'm torn. I'm torn. Obviously, I love this type of depletion, and it is much more preferable to me to have the most powerful land destruction effect be in black than to be in the blood moon color or in the colors that can also freely ramp alongside it for example green so in some ways and sinkhole in land destruction in general doesn't naturally pair that well with discard effects one good thing about discard effects is you can unbalance your opponent's hand. Like, let's say they mulligan to six and they keep like a two-spell four-land hand. You open on a discard spell, suddenly their hand is really unbalanced. Or even if they didn't mulligan, you know, it's three spells, four lands, you get the idea. But if you discard on turn one to take a spell away, and then you sinkhole on turn two to take a land away, you are trading one for one and you are taking maybe their best cards, maybe you're setting them back on tempo you're kind of setting yourself back on card advantage if your opponent is able to function and draw spells, though, if you consider, you know, trading a spell for a land to be a form of disadvantage. So the point I'm trying to make here is it may or may not be busted. It is an individually very powerful card. I don't think Wizards is that likely to print it. At the same time, it might be more reasonable than some people are thinking, especially if they don't plan to do anything about the very difficult to interact with tier one land strategies that have been terrorizing modern for the last couple of years. So who knows? Sinkhole, a very interesting one. Gotta remember that it exists. I wouldn't really look for it in MH2, but you never know. Some of my non-midrange main viewers may be feeling that this video has been a little bit too midrangey, but hey, what do you expect from me? Nevertheless, we have to accommodate the non-midrange players as well. How better to do so than by discussing Counterspell, the classic Counterspell for two blue. It's an interrupt. It's not an instant. Get it right. It's an interrupt. Counters target spell as it is being cast. We did have a few mentions here, and it's not specific to the Discord. I think we've dug some interesting gems up and made some good cases here, but Counterspell is one of those that everybody talks about when you're talking about MH2, right? You'd find that in any discussion. We do give Wagga Wagga credit for being the first one here to mention it. Lame Boy also on the Counterspell train. Um, maybe Lotus's Dan mentions it as well. Honestly, I've got no real issues with Counterspell. The one interesting thing um, Wagga Wagga also mentioned is Memory Lapse. Now, let's take a look at Memory Lapse. It is kind of a another 
of the non-counter spell two mana permission spells that would be part of the mix in modern alongside remand and logic knot and whatever else you've got uh delay even sees sim play memory lapse is very interesting for one gray one blue another interrupt counter target spell put that spell on top of its owner's library the ubiquity lately of ether gust shows us just how powerful putting a card back on the top is and memory lapse is very very interesting in that regard would it see play it's very very um tough for me to say as a non control player not a very high level one anyway i have played it in the past but when i played you know we didn't have we didn't have half the tools that the current control players have and that would also depend of course on what the shell looks like around it so as with the other things that we've mentioned here i would urge not printing both right we don't need to make two mana permission twice as powerful as it currently is by printing both counter spell and memory lapse especially if people are underrating these types of effects one or the other i see no issue again i am not afraid of powerful cards i'm not afraid of powerful effects what i'm afraid of is very powerful pushed effects that cannot fail counter spell can fail you know people are playing through ether vial people are playing through cavern of souls people are just getting ahead on board and then winning the game while the control player draws a counter spell off the top and they can't really recover right so counter spell powerful yes iconic yes not really seeing much play in legacy as far as i understand and maybe pauper is the format that is has its identity to some degree helped out and uh, defined by counterspell but maybe it could find a place in modern too and if not counterspell what about memory lapse blue mages i need your help here chime in in the comments let me know what you think about these two options and next up is a card that i covered in my modern horizons one speculation safe to say we didn't get it second times the charm maybe it is per pernicious deed i was very excited about the prospect of this card back then i am less excited about it now but it is definitely still one that i would welcome into the format i think it'd be totally fine very interesting we would see how it all came together it's just a little bit slow these days and i don't know exactly how powerful it would end up being but it is a unique effect it is a very strong effect and maybe it would be just another good interactive card and it's possible that i am underestimating it it's also possible i was overestimating it in the past only one way to find out wizards let's print it let's see what we've got anyway for those who don't know it's a three mon enchantment one gray one black one green you resolve it for that and then the activated ability you pay x sacrifice pernicious deed destroy each artifact creature and enchantment with converted mana cost x or less so a few things to note number one it is slow number two a lot of the decks that were rolling around when i was interested in pernicious deed are no longer really there uh hardened scales is here but it took a big hit with the ban of mox opal affinity of course totally dead the ether vial decks they do wax and wane but they're overall you know humans was huge back when we were talking about pernicious deed maybe going into mh1 things like that so um that said it would still be very good uh against the shadow decks there is always a small creature deck but the small creature decks are a little more they have a little less disruption on a stick in the way that humans like merfolk and other decks like that did or they have less resilience than the decks like hardened scales did where they really stymie one for one interaction a lot of the time these days the disruption tends to come by either getting you dead really quick like in the case of mono red prowess or by playing a lot of thought seizes and other interactive cards in the case of the racto shadow decks so would permicious deed line up as well against the format now i don't think so due to the factors i just mentioned and also due to the format just having generally been power crept forward that said pernicious deed is still a really nice catch-all sweeper effect it's also um you know if you have the luxury of time you can set it up to be a real catch-all the other really interesting thing about pernicious deed that if it's powerful enough could incentivize a build around is that it was designed in the era before planeswalkers so it's sweeping up artifacts and creatures and enchantments but notably not planeswalker so if you're looking at a rock build that again we're looking at some high curve stuff here but if you play 
a ton of low curve interaction. You could even build around like a Taziger or Gurmag Angler to have some high CMC stuff that would survive a deed and a ton of Planeswalkers and then Pernicious Deeds as your big catch-up cards, as your big sweeper effects. You could also dip into Jun to get that sweet Ren and Six value. Is just another really playable, really powerful card that does not die to deed. That said, I don't think it would turn the format on its head. I don't think it would single-handedly drag traditional BGX deck back up into contention. It is notably not that good with the Luris builds because those are more creature based and more low curve, right? But we do have a lot of people thinking it's a good idea in the Discord, and I don't disagree. John Dorian Smith, Dova Sam, Daniela MS, and Dawes Sauce, all on the pernicious deed train. I think I am too. I don't know exactly though how well it would do. Another one to look at here, my friends, is Goblin Lackey. Summon Goblin. You love to see... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> lines of text like that. It is a goblin creature for a single red mon. It's a 1-1. One, one. Whenever goblin lackey successfully deals damage to a player, you may choose a goblin card in your hand and put that into play. We've got some goblin stands in the Discord. We've got Wagga Wagga, Lame Boy, and Control Freak all advocating for goblin lackey, all assuming it'd be fine in modern. And I do tend to agree the card is strong enough to see legacy play, but at the same time, it's not exactly breaking legacy. It never really has, as far as I know. Modern also has more creature removal, especially right now. And on top of that, Goblin Lackey is not necessarily a complete free roll because you probably want to build around it a little bit. You cannot afford for it to be a 1-1 that doesn't really do much and that's just not able to displace a card, I would assume, in what is otherwise a currently strong goblin shell. So if you do want to build around it by putting in things in the deck that are more able to be um, to vastly snowball the game as they're cheated in with Goblin Lackey, well, you're going to have a fail rate with that if you raise your curve, if you play more bombs. I don't know what the bombs would be. I'm not a Goblin player. Let's say like Siege Yang Commander for the sake of argument. And your opponent's killing your Goblin Lackeys or even brick walling them in combat. Well, you have paid the price for including Lackey relative to other options and maybe a more streamlined shell, a more combo-oriented shell. Who knows? So Goblin Lackey, a powerful card, one we have to respect, but one that I suspect would probably be fine. Next, let us explore the concept of Veteran Explorer. Sorry I had to do it to you. It is a green soldier, a one-drop, one-one. If Veteran Explorer is put into any graveyard from play, each player may search his or her library for up to two basic land cards and put those lands into play. Shuffle up. After the fact, we've got a few people, unsurprising in a channel's Discord that is mostly known for mid-range play, people who are familiar with the Nick Fit deck and Legacy. Connor says he could use some Veteran Explorer slash Cabal Therapy action. Uh, Veteran Explorer also made Lame Boy's extensive list in the top category of cards that he would love to see. John Dorian Smith wants something like Veteran Explorer, if not the card itself, in Modern. As for myself, I don't exactly know. There are some things like Cabal Therapy, like Innocent Blood, that people have mentioned as potential ports into Modern anyway. And again, we would have to be careful about too many powerful synergies, you know, printing all of these effects together might make modern feel a little bit less like modern, a little bit too much on the nose like legacy, and could also have the risk of overrunning the, the format. That said, are these things really going to warp the format? I'm just, I just don't think so. I think modern is probably more powerful than most of us realize these days, and veteran explorer does have some things that we'd like about it. It does, you know, check greedy land bases, it is a value positive thing that does in some ways reward an interactive deck, but kind of like Goblin Lackey, it does have maybe not a fail rate, but maybe a deck building incentive that skews you toward bigger bombs, toward higher curve things. I'm not as much a fan of that. Like when I play Green Black, I am excited to get in incremental advantage and to interact really efficiently, and especially with the more recent Hex Drinker and Luris builds, to use every available mana source every turn if it is all possible. With Veteran Explorer, it's like, okay, we do some interacting, we do some trading, we have some synergy, and then we like find a big bomb and we've ramped into it, and then we can't lose. 
uh, that's okay. You know, there are definitely worse offenders in all formats than a Nick Fit style deck. But am I that excited about it? Maybe not. But in the comments, you can let me know. Make the case for or against Veteran Explorer. And if it became legal, I'd certainly have to give it a shot. Now, for a pure and beautiful example of black-based interaction, this one comes to us again from Lame Boy. This is Encroach. Wh I mean, like I posted in the Discord, I defy you, I dare you to look at this card, the old border, and tell me that black is not the coolest card in modern. You tell me that, you're lying, my friends. Encroach. Look at target player's hand and choose a non-basic land card from it. That player discards that card. Major blackmail energy here, but blackmail only sometimes takes a land. This always and only takes a non-basic land. How playable is it? I don't really know, but it if it's, if it's not that playable, I guess no harm done. It's a cool card entering modern. And if it is playable, the only thing it will do, because the downside, if it's dead, and or even if it's just taking up sideboard slots and it's not that useful, is enormous. The only thing it will do is keep land-based busted strategies in check. And if we don't want to print more aggressive land destruction effects and we don't want to make any bans, there might need to be kind of a way through the back door to compete with these strategies in ways that are not currently on the map. So maybe Encroach or maybe a similar design. Something to mention, something to think about. Don't really know if it'd see much play as things stand, even if it were to be printed into modern, but I would happily own a few just because it's that cool. A lot of the Discord comments we've already read have mentioned Cabal Therapy, therapy by the by. This is a card that, in theory, actually merits more thorough and more careful analysis than arguably anything I've covered here, because the ceiling of the card is really high, the floor of the card is really low in many ways, unless you are synergistic with sacrificing creatures or putting them in their graveyard, then the floor becomes really high again. So it's a complicated card. It runs the risk of slotting directly into all-in graveyard strategies, enabling them to have unprecedented levels of hand interaction compared to more fair decks, while also fueling their own plan at the same time. This is probably beyond my expertise, frankly, to evaluate, because it would need a legacy veteran and a modern veteran to really tell you how it would come into modern right now, but I'm not going to bother here because the video's already been very long, because there are more videos to come, and because I think the printing of Cabal Therapist as a flagship card of MH1, remember that was one of the two that they spoiled on the first day of official spoilers, means that we're just not going to see this card in modern probably ever. Certainly, I would suspect, not in MH2. That would be a major admission that design has gone off the rails since MH1, possibly before, definitely including MH1. So I just don't think we're going to get it. And next up, another black card, Braids Cabal Minion, a 4-drop for 2 gray, 2 black, Minion Legend was the old creature line, now it says Human Minion. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player sacrifices an artifact creature or land. She is a 2-2. The art is disturbing. It is an old bordered black card. It's got a really unique effect. It is symmetrical. This is one of the cards I am most excited about in a conceptual way, I think. You know, in theory, I think she's banned in Commander, right? I don't really play Commander, certainly not competitively. I think she's banned in there, so if you have all the build arounds and it's a multiplayer game especially, maybe she's oppressive. In Modern, she's a 4 mana 2-2 with a symmetrical effect that's slow to get going. You know, there's no ETB or anything. I think it'd be a far reach to say she would warp the format but she is very, very cool. Let's tab over to the Discord. We have Lame Boy and... Oh, there were more, weren't there? I guess it's just Lame Boy repeatedly agreeing with Steven Mirabito, and uh, Mr. Mirabito makes a great case for Braids. For what it's worth, I agree with Lame Boy's agreement. Mirabito says, here's a card I would love to see in Modern, because it would slot into a resource depletion archetype, and it being a 4 mana 2-2 two, two means it most likely would not be too powerful. However, I think it could nicely slot into our beloved black midrange with necessary adjustments to accommodate the downside, as it would make for a powerful curve topper to complement our hand disruption and removal spell suite. 
I imagine going thought season to removal into lingering souls into braids would be a fun but very reasonable thing to do in modern. And again, I completely agree. It's powerful, it's synergistic, it's a unique effect. It can get us out of a lot of situations that more traditional interaction might fall short of, and also has a very high ceiling in much the same way that a couple of the other each upkeep this happens type of cards that we've looked at so far would. But as Mirabito goes on to say, this would not break any strategies, might not even really be good enough to see a lot of play, but he would really enjoy seeing a card that incentivizes this type of build around. I completely agree. And uh, notably, kind of like Pernicious Deed, you know, we're looking at artifacts, creatures, or lands, does not get Planeswalkers, um, does not get enchantments either for what's that, what that's worth, but this was in the pre-Planeswalker era. So Braids, even if you get everything to line up, she's not deterministically locking your opponent out of all permanents if they can't answer her over time. They're still sticking enchantments, which is a problem for a black base deck. Not all black base decks are rife with enchantment removal. Obviously, if the opponent has a Planeswalkers and Braids has a symmetrical effect affecting both players, well, the opponent with the Planeswalker value is actually probably pulling ahead, right? All else being equal. So Braids seems really safe to me, really unique, really cool. Let's have her. Let's bring Braids this uh, this very, very frightening Cabal Minion into Modern and see what happens. Pretty spicy one to cover next, it is Fire Covenant, a 3 mana instant, 1 gray, 1 black, 1 red. Fire Covenant deals X damage divided any way you choose among any number of target creatures, where X is equal to the amount of life you pay. And the classic Ice Age line of text effects that prevent or redirect damage cannot be used to counter this loss of life. The old phrasing is just so charming to me. Speaking of the old Ice Age cards, Fiery Justice, of course, is a Naya correlate to the Rakdos Fire Covenant. Uh, Fiery Justice is granting the opponent life after distributing damage among the opponent's creatures. Um, rewarding the opponent, Fire Covenant punishes the caster, unless, of course, you are on a Shadow build, in which case it might serve as an enabler. Not that Shadow really needs any more enablers, but it would be interesting, you know. Shadow decks can maybe struggle with go-wide strategies. What if you, um, in a very interactive meta that you don't need to race as often, you could consider Fire Covenant competing maybe with Teamer Battle Rage or similar effects as a way to not have to punch through the go wide board, but just kill it. Just kill it. You can play more defensively that way, play more interactively that way. I don't think it's as powerful of a card in a vacuum, but it is a very interesting one. This suggestion came from Dawes Sauce, who does mention the synergy with Rakdos Shadow. I agree with that, and I agree with his other thoughts there. And I think this is an interesting one. It sees some commander play uh, where you have more life to draw from, and obviously more creatures to kill. You don't not uh, limited to one player's creatures, right? So in 1v1, it is definitely a little bit less synergistic outside of that shadow shell, I would imagine, but definitely couldn't hurt, right? I think the more old cards, the more interactive and unique cards, and again, ones with floors that are reasonable, ones that can fail, why not? Let's have some more effects like this in Modern. Next is another Lame Boy suggestion, and this is one that I do believe was something that I was mentioning around the time of MH1 as well. Miri's Guile, it is an enchantment for a single green during your upkeep. You may look at the top three cards of your library and put them back in any order. So this does take a few of my personal boxes in that it's a card that can fail. It's not replacing itself, so you're getting card selection at the cost of card advantage. Huh, you know, design used to work that way. That's really interesting how that works, right? And um, it is definitely something that is a powerful effect, but again, a bad top deck, not churning you through the deck in the sense of acquiring more resources, but selecting. And of course, when you pair it with fetch lands, because this is happening in the upkeep before the draw step, there can be even more selection involved than is immediately apparent on the card. It therefore is really skill testing. One of the downsides is if somebody resolves a turn one guile, if it becomes very commonplace in 
the meta, then maybe people are spending too much time, you know, in the same way that Sensi's Divining Top could slow down the game. So definitely a quality of life concern, maybe. Beyond that, it's a difficult card to rate. My first thought is maybe it powers up combo decks too much, but if you look at green combo decks, I think a lot of them are relatively redundant, right? Um, in fact, like, yes, if they keep a one threat hand and you discard or kill the threat, then Miri's Guile will help dig them toward a threat where they otherwise would be more or less top deck dependent. But, you know, a deck like Infect does have a sufficiently high threat count and does have a great deal of redundancy beyond that with the types of pump effects and protection effects that they like to play. So will Miri's Guile be sufficient to warrant a slot in decks like that? I really don't know. I couldn't say. Arguably, it would fit better into interactive decks such as The Rock, such as Jund, whatever, you know, mid-range decks where there is a much greater wrong half of the deck problem, especially game one. You're looking at the conditional upside if it goes to the graveyard of growing your Tarmogoyf and so on and so forth. I don't know, there could be something here. Difficult card for me to rate, but an intriguing one. One worth uh, keeping in mind and one where the design, I think, is very interesting, possibly underexplored in modern, but possibly Possibly that is for a good reason. Not exactly certain. We saved one of the best for, best for last, my friends. Rashad and Port. This is definitely a very, very powerful one. A card that sees a good deal of legacy play. And there's a few people who are into it in the Discord. It made the lists of Lame Boy and Matt, which were rather extensive. And we also have Ironwork summing it all up, saying Rashid and Port would be fine. In modern, change my mind. Uh, these people are in good company. I remember in MH1, I believe it was Jim Davis, who predicted that Rashad and Port would not only be fine in modern, but would be a very likely inclusion to the point of even saying it was going to be one of the featured box toppers, something like this. I'm not exactly probably getting it correct, but you understand the point. Lots of voices have uh, said that Port would be fine in modern. It is another kind of creative way to hate out big mana strategies in a way. You're not dealing permanently with the issue, but maybe you're forcing the big mana strategies to deal with your land, to play more copies of something like Ghost Quarter, for example, at the cost of their own mana development, their own linearity. Otherwise, maybe you can tempo them out of the game with port. The obvious best fit for port is Aether Vial decks, where you're developing your quote-unquote mana through Aether Vial, playing through that repeatedly, tempoing the opponent out with Rashad and Port. And obviously it's not a free roll inclusion because of course you're tapping two lands to tap one of the opponent's lands. So all else being equal, that's actually not a very good ability. That's why the card inherently sort of balances itself. Many people might not like the gameplay that it leads to. I can understand that. And you pair it with some other extreme mana denial or tempo denial effects. Obviously we could be in for it. But if you look at maybe Port being part of a go small blue tempo plan or making ether vial decks a little bit stronger are these really the things we're afraid of in modern no that sounds exactly like what we should be doing so port is a card i've never played i've never played the card you guys let me know what you think but i wanted to round out this video by including it it's one of the big bombs it's one of the ones that many thought was coming in mh1 we didn't get it as I said before, maybe the second time will be the charm. Okay, friends, so there you go. I hope that was fun for you. Some of the most fun I've ever had as a content creator was covering the MH1 spoilers, doing a little bit of speculation at the time uh, before the spoilers were starting to come out and then covering the, the spoilers in extreme detail as they came out. Looking back, it was a little bit of a laborious way in which I covered that. I didn't really get away from that here. There's just something about delving into the old bordered cards, the ancient, the days of yore of Magic the Gathering that makes me just want to talk for hours and hours. So I hope you enjoyed me doing so here. I hope to see you for the next video. Video. There's going to be at least one more. There's already many more cards I would like to cover that have come from the Discord. You in the comments below, you can also leave your thoughts, especially if you want to make a thorough case for a card, as we saw some people from the Discord making thorough, well-thought-out cases. I will give priority to the people in my Discord. I will also 
factor in my own excitement about the card as well as the likelihood, I think, of it actually entering modern, right? So if I don't pick your card, no offense, but feel free, regardless of whether you think I will feature it in the next video or videos or not to leave your thoughts below. Thank you so much for watching. Big thank you to all Patreon supporters as always. Hope you guys enjoyed this theory video. Even if it was long, I hope you enjoyed doing it while you're listening to it, while you're doing something else, chores, driving, gaming, what have you, or you just enjoyed hanging out with me and relaxing. So, MH2, we all look forward to it with, as I believe I said in Discord, equal parts dread and anticipation, something like that. We know that things can go horribly awry, but there's reason to have hope. There's always reason to have hope, right? We've got some good um, pros, including Sam Black on the design team. That gives me a big, big... Um, boost of optimism where I might not otherwise have had it. So we will see what the future brings, but for now, here are some cool ones to think about and maybe to watch out for. We'll see if any of them enter modern. Until the next video, my friends, take it easy. Let me know what you think, and I'll talk to you soon.